Good evening, mathematicians and lay mathematicians, and welcome everyone else. My name is Jeff Cook. Um, I'm going to present a series of videos. This is the first part, a little background to a paper that I, Greg, and Dennis have in uh, preprint right now. It is entitled The Direct Proof of Three Minute Hypothesis. Now, try as best as you can to set aside your suspicions and just enjoy the mathematics that's going to be presented. Um, in the end, the Riemann hypothesis is just a mathematical problem. And like many that I'm going to present here that lead up to it, you will see it's pretty easy to get your head around uh, once you understand what's going on. Um, now, we are taking this very slowly. About a year and a half ago, I presented a finding to um, Greg and Dennis, and uh, we've been poking away at it, and this paper is the result of that. It is a, a proof of Riemann hypothesis. It's a direct proof, it's an algebraic proof, it's very falsifiable. We have had a number of uh, mathematicians uh, try to beat it up, and uh, to date there are no errors found. We do know that every equation in the proof is correct, and uh, um, now it's, we believe it is time to begin explaining the proof. And I don't believe that I would be fair if I didn't include those who were non-mathematicians. Because of that, I am going to explain everything leading up to the Riemann hypothesis, including my findings, and so that everyone can be on the same page, uh, experts in, in uh, number theory, as well as anyone with a eh, high school, first year college mathematics background. Okay, um, I also am going to do my best, please forgive me if I fail, I'm going to do my best to uh, present this in, in a completely non-pretentious way. I'm just going to try to make it fun and uh, relaxing and enjoyable. If there's anything fun about mathematics, I'm going to find a way to present it. Not sure if there are. Okay, so a little background of who we are. All right, uh, Dennis uh, P. Allen is uh, received his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, with distinction. He then um, went on to as assistant professor uh, teaching calculus, uh, logic, um, general mathematics, uh, you name it. He's uh, quite an accomplished mathematician and a very smart and, and nice guy. Greg Volk is equally uh, sharp. Um, he graduated from Stanford. He and uh, he was always been too humble to tell me, but I heard from Dennis that he graduated the top 1% of his class. He has written and edited numerous papers, uh, mathematic papers and uh, um, physics, and has a very good way of tearing apart other people's work. <laughs> and we've had many heated conversations in the past year and a half, and uh, um, I think that's kind of necessary. Um, the heated conversations are all so that we can all get on the same page what are we discussing and how could it be wrong and and going over all these he is he writes out when he's going over somebody else's work um this is the way he presents it when he's uh, or how he presents himself when editing people's papers is he will rewrite every equation and rewrite it and and simplify it and uh, um and tear it apart and if there's another way to express that equation in a simpler way he's going to find it uh Amongst the three of us, we have found a way to get this paper or this proof under 10 pages. This was our goal and under 10 steps. Um, I'm going to begin way back at the beginning. When I mean the beginning, I mean, I mean uh, back all the way to Plato. Okay, so that's where the origins of this hypothesis lie. All right, now where to find the preprint? You can go to Google and do a search research gate Cook, Riemann hypothesis, and it should be the first uh, link that comes up. You can download the PDF from researchgate.net. And if it doesn't come up in Google for you, just go to researchgate.net and uh, do a search for me, Jeffrey Cook, or Dennis Allen. Greg is not on the uh, uh, on ResearchGate now. Now you do need to be a, a published published researcher to become a mem member but you do not need to be a member to download this print. We've made it public. All right, so it's been up there a few months. We're taking this very slowly, and uh, feel free to go pause this and go get the paper, or after you're done watching this video, or the entire series, which is gonna take three or four videos, uh, feel free to get the paper. All right, um, 
let's get started. Oh, before we do, um, if you see from my other videos, I am a big fan of dark humor. Um, there's no dark humor in my proof or in this this um, presentation. But if you are a fan of dark humor and need a little uh, laughter in your hard times in the world, the world is a very dark place right now. Uh, I think the best way to brighten that is up is with a little humor. Uh, if you're not into dark, dark humor, please do not watch read the book. It has received some uh, good reviews from uh, top, top reviewers at Amazon. Um, Grady Harp, he's a Hall of Fame. He's a top 50 reviewer. Um, he writes, Jeff Cook pounces onto the literary scene with a fascinating first novel that is one of the more interesting concepts in storytelling to grace the bookshelves in some time. I do like fiction. I'm not a big fiction writer. Um, this is the only novel I've ever written, but I, I'm a big fan of it, particularly uh, dark humor. Okay, and Daniel Jolly, super nice guy. He's also a, a top reviewer. He gave it five stars. He writes, uh, Jeff Cook's first novel really stands out from the crowd in terms of both originality and excellent, insightful writing. Thank you, Daniel. All right, I am working on another book. It is a book on physics. It goes also back to the ancients, uh, all the way from the ancients to today, uh, and some of the highlights and high points of uh, humankind's research into light. Okay, it's a book on physics. I deal with uh, um, Maxwell, Faraday, uh, you know, Euclid. Right? So, um, it's, I got about one chapter left, and I hope to have that soon, uh, time permitting. All right. Well, let's get into it. Part one is, is just leading up to the Riemann zeta function. So everything leads up to the Riemann zeta function. Well, not everything, but what is relevant or relevant to the proof. Now, this is an unscripted uh, um, unscripted uh, video. So bear with the ums and, you know, all everything else that comes with an unscripted video. I am not very good. I'm much better at reading, but I'm going to give it a try. All right. So... We got some gold miners in this, uh, um, in in uh, leading up to the Riemann hypothesis. Mathematical gold miners. Okay, we're going to be over the first with the, the sieve of Eratosthenes. All right, so a sieve in gold mining is where you take you, you're panning for gold and uh, you, you scoop out the rocks at the bottom of the river and uh, uh, throw a certain angle. Gold's really heavy, so it's going to get stuck in the sieve and all of the other rocks fall out. And so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take the natural numbers greater than one, and we're gonna shake them up a bit and see if we can drop out and leave behind just the gold. All right, here we go. This, this is, um, well, let's just begin. Okay, so remove every second number after two, just eliminate them. So we still have two, we have three, but then we got rid of all the odds. We got four, six, eight, all of them just dropped out. We're gonna do this now every third number after three. So we leave behind two and three and five, then it skips up and it gets rid of 10 and, and, and all, all of the uh, multiples of, actually 10 is with the multiples of two. Then we remove, remove all of the multiples of three. All right, so then we're gonna keep on shaking the pan or the sieve and we're gonna remove every fifth number after five. And then that eliminates all the remaining multiples of five. And we're gonna continue doing that with every number that is left. Now we're gonna to go to, uh, um, and we continue this on way to infinity, and the gold is what's left behind. And these are the prime numbers, all right? You know what prime numbers are? I don't think I need to explain them, all right? They are the building blocks of all of the other numbers. See, so we removed all of the products and we left, we, we're left with the core of the natural numbers. That's the way I like to say it anyway. Okay, see that trick? We're going to use it, all right? And we're going to continue this analogy of gold prospecting as we go through here. All right. Now, jump. This that's the sieve of Roth, uh, Rothschilds. I'm not. I'm not sure how to say that. All right. So it's a bit of a tongue twister for me. But um, that was done. I think about fifty to a hundred years after Euclid. All right. Euclid was the first one to prove that the number of primes are infinite, okay? So now we're gonna jump to the early 1800s. We're just gonna skip way, so you see I'm not touching everything that was done with it. We're skipping way, way into the future to the early 1800s. And we're just gonna begin with some very elementary arithmetic. All right, one divided by one, everyone knows, is one. 
Oh, well, I'm using Team Viewer and it's not used to it. One divided by one equals one. Okay, something just locked up. You bear with me? There we go. Okay. Equals one. I knew it did. I just, I it was, it was a tricky calculation, but um, one plus one half equals three halves. And, uh, and uh, we're going to add a third, and we're going to add a fourth, and we're going to add a fifth to infinity. And as you see, as we go towards infinity, the numerator um, on the right-hand side of the equation is increasing far more rapidly than the denominator. And so when we take this out into infinity, uh, we're going to end up with an infinite sum, an infinite uh, value. Not very meaningful, other than the fact that this harmonic series is prevalent in nature. And so it's not of heard of, unheard of to have uh, infinite sums. I mean, time, after all, is an infinite sum, one second plus two second. So, but manipulating such sums is uh, not very possible. And so we want this to converge in some way. So how might we get to uh, increase the denominator faster than the numerator so that uh, we can get a finite sum? And we could do that by square in the denominator. And uh, um, let's do that. We get this nice value, 1.64493 and so on. It's a very beautiful number. And uh, um, this number, kind of posed a problem for mathematicians. It's called the Basel problem. It was, well, is there a rational expression? Is there an identity of this number? Can we, can we look at this in rational form? And uh, many mathematicians, uh, you know, tried to tackle this and struggled and failed. All right, so along came a very intelligent mathematician. And like the sieve we did earlier, he had a way, he approached mathematics like he were he was gold prospecting prospecting for gold and and i'm going to keep that analogy going because i think you're going to find it very useful so let me just explain a little how prospecting for gold works all right so if you're going out into the the high desert and there's there's mountains off in the distance you're going to eliminate certain mountains that aren't good candidates okay uh the red mountains um probably not good they're they're they're, they're not uh, going to have the ideal structure or the ideal um, rocks. They're going to have mostly um, what are those. I don't remember what type of rocks are. I'm not, you know, in this field. Okay, but <laughs> they're going to be red and they're from a volcano. Uh, the gold's going to be buried. You're not going to find anything. So once you find the right mountain, then you kind of go along, try to start climbing towards it. You find a river and you uh, start panning for gold. Once you find a little gold, you move up river and you find a little more gold, you move up river and you keep going in this way until the, you stop finding gold. And then you backtrack to where you last find gold and you start climbing the mountain at that spot. So that means that the gold is coming down in that area and it's washing out the other. So Euler kind of does that like the sieve of Eratos. I'm going to try it. All right, hold on. Erato Sinise. Oh, my goodness. All right, my name's easy, Jeff Cook, so here it's very easy to say. I'm sorry. So maybe that's why I don't have practice in this. Anyway, this is the first gold nugget that Euler found. And it's a very beautiful rational expression of pi squared over 6. It made him instantly famous because of all of the other mathematicians who have tried and failed. And he had a proof at first, so he thought he solved the basal problem, but his proof was not accepted. It took about five years for him to come up with one that was accepted, but the damage was already done. He was instantly famous. And so the gold rush begins. Everyone starts trying to throw other powers at this, uh, um, uh, it, we would call it a generalization of the harmonic series. And let's go throw three into the power of the denominator and we get this beautiful number but we can't find the gold okay we, the only thing we know about this number is that it is a transcendental number all right and that was discovered many years after euler okay so we look for the power of four in the denominator and very nicely another gold nugget pi to the power of four over 90. what about five no no such luck what about six yes another one and uh, um, as we continue through all of the even, uh, integers greater than, um, well, all the positive even integers, we get, um, we know everything about these numbers. So that's where all the gold is at this point. Okay, what do we know about the odds? Um, very little, 
but as you will see, and I would say many, if not most, mathematicians are unaware of this, but if you were to tear into Riemann's paper, which we're going to get into in a second, um, you will see that all of the value output of this function will involve pi to the power of s over 2, um, and, or uh, except for the evens, all right? So um, they're going to cancel to just leave pi to the power of s. Going to get into that. However, since it is not readily known for the odd numbers what rational number, if a rational number is a multiple of that, we can't express it in rational form. So if you want a really difficult problem to tackle and you think you're up for it, go for this one. It's been around since before the Riemann hypothesis even. So it's a very difficult problem. Look at those odd numbers, put them in rational form and prove it. Okay, so this is called to the generalization of the harmonic series where we are raising the denominator to a power, uh, some power, and we're gonna call that power, we're gonna give it a name, S, okay? So, like I tell my son, if you have very little mathematics background, uh, you can use this analogy of a function. Uh, I tell my son, think of a function like a microwave oven. You give it some input, that input is time, and they, my, that microwave oven does one thing, typically. It gives some heat over time, that's your output. So you give the function uh, input and you get the function to output something. All right, so our input is S and we can give it some value, S some value, and we should get something out. Now, if you if you were to hammer around on this uh, um, generalization of the harmonic series, you will find that, uh, um, well, you can't just plug in any old S. You can't plug in one, that doesn't work. Uh, that would just reduce to the harmonic series itself can't plug in zero for s, you can't plug in any of the negative integers, you can't plug any complex numbers, okay? You can only plug in numbers where the real part of s is greater than greater than one. Okay, so that is, um, leaves us kind of hanging. Uh, a couple things we might notice about that uh, as we get going. All right, so again comes Euler and he's going to want to do some more prospecting all right he didn't tell us really how he well kind of if you read his work you see a little bit how he got that first nugget he, he did the proof but sometimes when you have when you find something the proof may not represent how you found that and so that's why i'm presenting this these videos because it's going to lead up to how i found the proof the proof would not include any of this in these in these first three videos and so how Euler found the first gold nugget is interesting, but we're going to see how he does his prospecting very quickly as we look at this. So he's looking at this, and he wants to, he's looking for something more. He's looking for gold nuggets just like um, Eratosthenes. All right, did I say it right? <laughs> Help me out if I didn't. Okay, and how's he going to do that? So he's going to take this. He's going to give the left-hand side a name. Um, right hand side, it's the left hand side. Um, and we're going to call that zeta of s. All right, we gave the power and the denominator its its name s, and we're going to give the function now a name zeta, and we're going to do some prospecting, just like like panning for gold, uh, like the sieve we did earlier. Multiply both sides by one over two to the power of s. Okay. And we're going to, like the sieve, we're going to, I'm not even saying his name anymore, you see that? Arado Finis. I can't do it, I can't do it. Sorry, I refuse. All right, eliminate the multiples of two in the denominator on the right side, okay? So that's what we just did. We subtract one minus one over two to the power of S, and then look on the right-hand side, all the multiples of two in the denominator are gone. All right, now we're gonna repeat this, eliminate the multiples of three in the denominator, in the same way we do with two, and we're gonna repeat, multiples of five, and as we keep going on into infinity, it reduces to one on the right-hand side, and we're gonna solve that for zeta of s, and we get what is called the Euler product. All right, Euler product is very beautiful because it connects the prime numbers to the natural numbers. You see that? So we have the generalization of the harmonic series is equal to this product on the right over the primes. You like that? I think it's pretty amazing, actually. So 
now we have this equality, all right? And I'm not saying Euler stopped with it, but he did find he did find the gold. Now, along comes another individual. His name is, is Riemann, okay? Now, he doesn't prospect like Euler at all, right? He, if Euler climbs up the mountain and, and digs for the gold, Riemann turns the mountain upside down and shakes the gold out, okay? That's just his approach. In fact, the, the magnitude of manipulation that Riemann does, it, it's just it's hard to comprehend how that fits in all in one brain, okay? But he, he, he does lay out some very beautiful results with what he... He does, and this is building up to the Riemann hypothesis, which of course comes from him. All right, so this is now called the Riemann zeta function. All right, the Riemann zeta function is, we would say on the left-hand side, is the analytic continuation of the generalization of the harmonic series, okay? The Riemann zeta function is a lot easier, all right? Right, because the, uh, um, the generalization of the harmonic series only converges when the real part of S is greater than one. And what Riemann wanted to do with this is he is interested, he's interested in the gold too. He's looking for prime numbers. He wants to know everything about the prime numbers. This, he sees this, all right, but what more can we do with this? We, there's something really important that he wants to do, and, and it's, it's kind of a bold attempt. Um, but he pulls it off, and he, he, what he wants, he's looking at this, and he said, I wonder if uh, this is gonna tell us anything about the prime counting function. So uh, the prime counting function, if you uh, are unaware, is simply you take the number of primes up to a given argument, count them up, and there's your output. So for instance, if our input is the number six, um, and then we count the number of primes, we got what, how many, two is prime, three is a prime, Five is a prime. Okay, that's three primes that are add up to six, or that not up to, but that we have uh, the number of primes up to six, and so the output is three. And we could do this for any um, natural number. Well, it that becomes very cumbersome when you get to very large uh, uh, inputs, right? It's not a it's not a function that's easy to work with. We could just plug into a calculator. Um, so if we're talking about prime numbers up in, into, you know, large, large hundreds of digits, um, like some of those used in encryption algorithms, uh, it doesn't, it, it it's just a practic practical, it'll take uh, amount, the same amount of time to calculate as it would from the time of Eratosthenes, see, I almost said it, uh, up to Rima. Okay, so he wanted to come up with a function where he could just plug in a number x, and it gives x some value and outputs the number of primes up to x, okay? And he wrote a paper. It was called um, uh, On the Number of Primes Less Than a Given Magnitude. And as he was on the way to this, one of the things he needed to do is analytically continue the generalization of the harmonic series. So he came up with the functional equation. And uh, so now he can just plug in. So Functional equation he wants for the zeta function, and one he wants a, he wants a, a functional equation for the number of primes less than a given magnitude. So this is the big thing that's kind of we're going to focus on as we go forward. Um, and I definitely will show his results because it's very important in terms of the prime numbers, and it's very important in terms of the Riemann hypothesis. All right, but this function comes along. This is what he gets on the way. It's his tool. Uh, it's called the functional equation of the Riemann zeta function. And it's a product of five functions in itself. You see, we got two to the power of s, that's a function. Pi to the power of s minus one. You know what pi is, the, you know, the number that's the ratio between the circumference of a circle to half is radius or two times its radius and sine of pi times s over two I'm familiar with the sine function i'm assuming i hope uh if not you go look it up google it gamma function of one minus s i'm going to touch a little on the gamma function because it has some interesting results that lead up to the riemann hypothesis and again we then have zeta of one minus s all right so we got zeta of some argument on both sides this Relationship between s and 1 minus s is very important in terms of the Riemann zeta function. But 
this is his functional equation that he is able to get his final result in the paper on the number of primes less than a given magnitude. And we're going to take, uh, take care of that and go over that in the next video. Uh, thank you. This is just the introduction. I understand if you are an expert at uh, the number theory and the Riemann hypothesis, all of this is review but I want everyone to be on the same page when we get to the end of part four. Thank you, and uh, see you in the next video.